Can you hear me? Am I coming in? Wonderful. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for um, coming to hear about Matrix. Um, so uh, I've got quite a lot of stuff here. I'm going to go quite fast. Apologies. Um, feel free to barge in with any questions at any point or wait until the end if we have time. So what is Matrix? It's all about decentralized persistent communication. Um, specifically, the way I think of it is, and um, apologies if this looks like buzzwords, it's not that it's open, it's an open source project, it's an open standard. Um, it's all about decentralized communication with no single points of control or failure. It's all about persistent communication. It's about having conversation history, which is eventually consistent over the whole internet. So there's no single point which controls or owns a conversation. Cryptographically secure um, from day one, in, well, almost from day one. The end-to-end -end security is, uh, encryption isn't quite there yet, but at least having a good um, set of semantics for cryptographically synchronizing data around the place. And you can basically think of it as a messaging database, a big JSON messaging conversation database, which provides a JSON over HTTP API. So more concretely, what is it for? You can use it for group chat and obviously one-to-one -one communication as a subset of group chat. You can use it as a standard WebRTC signaling layer, which is web-friendly because it's just HTTP, no SIP, no XMPP. Um, you can use it to bridge together communication silos that we see around the internet today. That could be a big silo like the PSTN or it could be a little one like WhatsApp. You can also use it for Internet of Things, um, data synchronization and communication, and basically anything that needs to publish and subscribe to persistent data to the world. Now, there are two kind of overriding principles to Matrix. First of all, everything is about conversation history and group communication as the first class citizens. So this is quite different to SIP or other signaling protocols. Instead, it's really looking at getting multiple devices for multiple users participating in the same virtual room, the same chat room, um, if you will. Everything is grouped by default. So if I have a one-to-one -one conversation with somebody, it's not a special private message on IRC or a one-to-one -one stanza exchange in XMPP or a, a equivalent in SIP. Everything is grouped. And the second law is, again, no single party owned these conversations. And this is the interesting thing, especially in the context of the VUC Visions panel yesterday, when folks were talking about ways um, to uh, get away from the cloud, get away from these single big vendors who go and trap all of your data and they mine it and they <clears throat> excuse me, hand it to the NSA or whatever thing they might be doing. Here, if I'm having a conversation with somebody, then their server has a copy of that conversation, and my one does too. There's no single vendor he or dependent on. So the very nature of the protocol is defragmenting things and going and sharing the data between different um, parties so that you're not locked in. So the way, another way of thinking of it is that SIP was initially built um, for initiating one-to-one -one sessions, as we all know, and it's obviously inspired by the use cases of the dear old PSTM. It's evolved a lot from that, but that's where it began. That's what the design principles are. Similarly, XMPP, all about passing messages from A to B, basically. It's obviously inspired by what would happen if you had a good protocol backing AIM and ICQ and MSN back then. Again, it's evolved lots and lots with lots of cool stuff on top, like Buddy Cloud and Federated Mux. That was at least the initial design thing. Matrix is a new protocol, as in that we're only uh, six months into beta now. Um, and the whole point is this idea of liberating and synchronizing conversation history. And the use cases we're looking at here are the communication apps that, in practice, lots of us use today. It's Slack, it's Hangouts, it's Link, IRC, Facebook, and WhatsApp, basically ones where you have a virtual room with lots of people in it, and the conversation is synchronized over all the participants. So why? Why have we done this? Well, I'm not going to bore you with the details, and I, I think that Simon covered quite a lot of them on the buddy cloud side of things earlier. Basically, we've got a real fragmentation problem today. You would think that Bob on the left has all these different choices of talking to Alice, and this gives him amazing user freedom, but in fact, it just gives him a really crap user experience. If he wants to video call Alice, he has no idea how to find her on which system, what identifier to use, and with WebRTC, it just gets worse. I mean, I understand why the WebRTC guys didn't specify a standard signaling protocol, because they wanted to leave it open for innovation and people to pick the right tool for the job. 
but the flip side is uh, <laughs> there are a lot of competing possibilities there. Everybody has ended up building their own proprietary HTTP um, API if they're not using SIPO for WebSockets or XMPP for the web. And it's we're encouraging people to build more silos. All of these WebRTC um, um, islands which can't talk to one another, and we're just getting further and further away from the idea of the internet, which was all about interoperability, sharing of data, just collaboration. Instead, people have got greedy, and they've gone and built these silos, which um, rely on locking their users into them, basically, to build the valuation so they get acquired for $20 billion. So they, that's basically the rationale to go and provide a very simple HTTP overlay pub sub layer for the internet that anybody can hook into, and you can bridge it into SIP, you can bridge it into XMPP, you can matrix together, if you will, all of these different islands um, into a good old-fashioned internet open um, overlay network. So, oh, that's not ideal. Well, you, in fact, all the information's there, even if it's a bit cropped. The Matrix ecosystem, as it stands today, kind of looks like the blue stuff from us on matrix.org and the orange stuff from everybody else. The main thing for Matrix is the Matrix, uh, matrix specification itself, which is a RFC-like document, which honestly isn't great, although we're working a lot on improving it, which is up on matrix.org, and it defines all of the API endpoints and the data structures and the semantics for the three different APIs which um, make up Matrix, which are the client-server API, connecting your clients to servers, and then there's the server server API, which federates together the servers, much like SIP or XMPP federation. And then finally, you've got the application service API, which is a bit like XMPP components or SIP application services or servers. And it's where you go and add on all of the additional exciting domain specific stuff. So we provide reference implementations. You've got Synapse, which is a Python twisted reference server. We've got a whole bunch of different application services, some written by us, some written by other people. And then we've got an entire stack on the client side because we wanted to put out something that was actually usable. I mean, it's not, it's not Slack, it's not slick and glossy and lovely. It's very much an open source project, but we wanted to do the whole thing from the front end all the way through the network just so that we could see what it felt like and people could play with it. So we've got a web stack using a JavaScript SDK. Then there is both an Angular um, JS SDK and a React SDK that we're writing at the moment on top. And then you've got um, an example web application, which you can find at matrix.org slash beta. On iOS, again, we've got the low-level HTTP wrapping library. Then you've got the UI reusable component library. And then you've got the actual um, um, application on top, which is a white-labeled iOS app. Um, it's even got WebRTC in it, courtesy of Ericsson, who contributed an open WebRTC uh, based on VoIP implementation for it. So it's kind of fun that it's uh, increasing, or well, it's already got more features than Slack, and it's kind of getting towards Hangouts, but in a completely open model. And then finally, on the Android side of things, we've got an SDK that handles both the UI and the HTTP layer, and then, again, a white-labeled example app on top. And meanwhile, loads of people have written other clients on top. I think we've got about eight or nine different ones, ranging from a WeChat command line plugin um, to a Lisp one that somebody wrote in New Lisp, and uh, Ruby ones, and uh, one in Kotlin. I hadn't even heard of Kotlin, the language, until somebody wrote a client in it. So that's basically what Matrix looks like. I've already, I guess, said basically what we are. Um, we're structured as a nonprofit project. Um, as Daniel said at the beginning, we're actually funded to work on this by my day job, which is with Amdox, which some of you might know is this huge um, telecom solutions provider. Um, Matrix is the first open source stuff they've done, and they've allowed us to basically do it as a completely incubated, um, independent um, open source project. The APIs you get, are the ones I mentioned, client server, server server, and application services. Everything here is Apache licensed. We deliberately picked as liberal a license as possible um, to basically try to encourage people to play with it and build out the ecosystem. And as the diagram showed, you've got server, client SDKs, clients, application services, and everybody else. So lots of slides. What does it actually look like? Well, let's have a quick jump into, say, the Firefox client. I have to wait for my Mac to. Oh, there we go. So this is a um, this is the Angular web client, which um, isn't the prettiest thing in the world. You can see it's very ugly. You can see the Odvar's going and um, sending photos. Oh, that's an exciting bug. <laughs> 
Uh, there we go, um, sending photos into it um, as we speak. And um, I think in this room, we're in hash matrix on matrix.org. So the names of the rooms are based on IRC channels, except they're associated with the domain that they were created on. But the cool thing is that this room has got a whole bunch of different people in it. You've got Evil Matthew, which is me with wearing a suit, and then you've got loads of other people. So this guy here is oh, running his own server. So if I hover over, you might be able to see his um, identifier, and these are opaque identifiers, which we don't expect to be used in the real world. I'll talk about identity in a minute. Is at Eric J on jki.re, because he's running a server on jki.re. Then you've got someone like Amandine, who's my co-founder on Matrix, who is, come on, overlay, Ugh. at Amandine on matrix.org. So I think we've got about 100 different servers in here. People like Truephone, <laughs> kindly running servers and federated into it and about 1,000 users all in the same room. So basically the room is, oh, you can see James popping up there on the top right, getting ready to heckle. <laughs> um, so basically, uh, all of the 100 servers here have a copy of the history of the room. So if any of them go down, they can resynchronize it in from the other participating servers. If any of them go offline for a bit, then they can work quite happily autonomously, and then when they come back online, it goes and merges the history together, a bit like Git or Cassandra or Dynamo or one of these um, eventually consistent um, databases. If you go and um, start punching into things, um, you can double click on anything in the Angular interface and it pulls up the underlying JSON. And you can see it's really simple JSON. The actual body of this message is just well, a body. You get the format of it, which is m.txt, or it could be an m.image or whatever. And the actual data type of the JSON, a little like an XMPP stanza, is matrix or m.room.message. It's completely extensible. You can chuck any JSON you like into here, and I'll give some examples in a minute. Um, I've got, I'm in a couple of hundred rooms here with different people. Some of them are, oh, actually, I'm not, because I'm on a test user. I'm in like, 20 rooms here. We're, some of them are one-to-one -one conversations. Some of them are group. Some of them are bridged into IRC. Um, some of them are bridged into other things like Tumblr and other application services. Um, I guess an interesting thing might be to try to do a WebRTC um, call to see what that looks like. So if I've got a one-to-one -one, um, chat like this, very interesting conversation here, and I go and pull up Chrome, and I um, wonder why I didn't already have a window open. So this is me as my normal at Matthew on matrix.org, who's a lot happier than evil Matthew um, in Firefox and put the two next to one another, and clearly this isn't going to work with the screen size, but let's try anyway. Um, then um, I go and send a message to Matthew and say, hi, non-evil Matthew, which you can just about see. Hopefully that means that I get the message coming in here on this side, and then you can see you've got these um, buttons up here. If I hit the video button, then I get a WebRTC call coming in from Firefox to Chrome, and I can answer that. And oh look, it's, uh, it's like you've never seen a video call before um, between the two. It's actually pretty fast setup because it's doing trickle ice. And if I go and hang up on this, again, you can see there's an incoming call widget that you can click on. And here, the JSON is obviously a much, much uglier in that you've just taken the SDP offer straight out of WebRTC, chucked it in JSON, um, put a lifetime for the message, give it a call ID, um, say that it's an offer. But actually, that's it for offering. You then have a single HTTP hit back to get the answer, and you're in the call. So it's kind of the anti-SIP. It's, it's just like all of the JSON HTTP APIs that folks use on an ad hoc basis, except it's a standard one. And trust me, it's really, really nice if you can just set up a call with two HTTP hits and not have to worry about your SIP library and you know, whether people escape the right angle brackets correctly and whether their record root headers are correct and all that sort of thing. So that's um, a quick demo of um, the web clients. I would show you the iOS one, but irritatingly, the network here doesn't let me screen share via air, mm, AirDrop or whatever it's called, Airport, AirPlay, AirPlay. So anyway, back to the um, presentation. Any questions at this point? Ollie. I, I will um, show you the call flows in a second that has the trickle lice um, messages in it, which um, shows why things um, go a little bit faster. Um, sorry for asking for a question and then punting on it, but <laughs> I have a slide. 
So the architecture itself, you probably gathered by now, looks a lot like email or SIP or XMPP, and you've got a bunch of clients which hang off a bunch of servers. You have the application services, which are the light blue things here, which you can think of as being like clients on steroids. They've got um, super user power, so they're like IRC services. They can go and masquerade entire ecosystems of clients, entire ecosystems of rooms. And then the one which I've kind of been skirting away from are identity services. Now, on the demo, you saw that people have these slightly weird identifiers of at username colon domain. We deliberately chose this so that people didn't think it was a Jabber ID or a SIP URI, and also because we don't expect people to use them. The model of identity in Matrix is to go and map from your existing identifiers, your email addresses, your phone numbers, your Facebook IDs, your Skype IDs, whatever it might be, your LDAP, your CAS credentials, um, through to these um, opaque private IDs within Matrix. Um, and basically I discover people using the credentials they use already. We don't want to add yet another Jabber ID thing into the world. We've got enough namespaces out there. So that's what the identity servers do. At the moment, they are logically centralized, but physically decentralized, a bit like DNS um, root servers. We're looking at ways to fix this. There's an entire other two-hour talk about federated identity and decentralized identity, which I won't go into now on ways in which we're looking to fix it. In terms of the functional responsibility, I've probably already gone through this. Clients are just talking a really simple HTTP API to the server. It can be as thin or as thick as it likes. So you can have a completely stateless client, which is just a curl command line doing a one line put to set up that call or to send a message. Or it can be a great big sprawling Angular web application like the one I showed you that uses HTML5 offline storage or local storage to cache everything and have as much state as you like. Home servers store all of your data. So again, it's like mail servers. This is possibly a bit of a design flaw in that it would be nice if your data was also decentralized over multiple servers. But right now, you have to pick the server that you use, and it's where your home is. And it has the advantage that you know precisely where your data lives for the conversations you participate in. The key thing, as I keep saying, is that you get the conversation history for the rooms that you're in, and other people do too. You can expire history from your home server, say you're running it on your phone, on the device, or if you're running it on a Raspberry Pi, you might only want a few days of history. But the nice thing is that as long as there are other servers participating, you can paginate and backfill history from other people in the network to go and pull them into place. Spoke about identity servers. And application services are where all the interesting business logic happens when you want to do more than just passing messages around the place. How does it work? Here is a, sorry, brace everybody as we go back into the um, browser. So if we, oh, there's Randy heckling for, on matrix.org. Um, if I go and pull up uh, the mainmatrix.org site, then actually at the bottom of the home page, we've got this little D3 visualization, which is my preferred way of modeling what's going on. So it's the same architecture, full mesh of servers, bunch of clients hanging off it. If Alice wants to send a message, um, it's just a single curl post here to chuck the JSON of hello and the text to her server. Her server goes and signs it and persists it in her database there because all of the traffic between the servers um, is signed for integrity because we want to have strong identity all the way through the system at least between the servers. Um, that gets pushed out full mesh to Bob and Charlie's servers, and the protocol for that is a little bit more chunky, and you've got the elliptic curve signatures in here um, to maintain uh, integrity um, and to make sure that nobody's spoofing Alice's server. That gets stored in those servers and then gets pushed out as typically just a polling get request um, to Bob and Charlie. So we have the simplest possible HTTP 1.0 API here. It's meant to work on crappy Internet of Things devices. It's not meant to be um, um, web sockets or co-app or MQTT. You can do that. You can replace this link with something sexier and more efficient if you want. But in the spec, we just give the simplest possible baseline. Um, if Bob responds, then we basically start building up a Git-style data structure, a directed acyclic graph of the messages in the room. And this message goes and points back to the previous one in the room, and it contains the signature, including the signature of that one. So just like Git, you can't fiddle with history in retrospect. Here, we're going and baking in cryptographic integrity to the room so you can prove that people haven't tampered with it in retrospect. 
Likewise, Charlie could uh, respond at the same time. And at this point, we've got a race condition, because Charlie said hi at the same time that Bob said hi. These are high latency links. All of the servers are inconsistent. But that's OK, because it is an eventually consistent database. All that happens is that Bob's message gets relayed out like this, and you split the graph on Charlie's server. Charlie's message also gets propagated out and, again, builds up the status structure and splits it, at which point everybody's in sync again. So it's just like a Git or Cassandra going and becoming consistent. Finally, Alice might send another message, and it heals this fork in the graph, and everybody ends up with this beautiful diamond directed acyclic graph data structure of the conversation history. Um, so that's how it works. Going back for the final time to the presentation. Um, in practice, we've got these three different APIs. Come on, PowerPoint. It's almost like Microsoft software on a Mac doesn't always work. Um, so we've got the client server API. So this is, again, this is literally the, the curl command line that you're just putting in the um, format of the message, the contents of it, and you're uh, checking it to a room whose ID you know, you're sending it, and the type of the data that you're sending is a matrix room message. And at the moment, we just put access tokens as query string parameters to identify people, which is horrible and terrible, and we're fixing it in favor of macaroons, but we're not there yet. If you're doing a WebRTC call, we already saw the JSON. Again, it's a bit more complicated, but you're basically just putting a version of the protocol call ID, offer, offer, and the STP, and off you go. Now, this is Ollie's um, slide. <laughs> if you're, the actual um, call flow is very, very simple here. Um, you've got a message, a JSON blob for inviting, which goes from the caller to callee. And that can contain as many STP candidates as the ICE um, um, stack has already discovered. And then as the ICE stack goes and discovers more candidates by talking to turn servers or talking stun to the other guy, then you start trickling in more candidates. And you just go and pass these in as an M core candidate, which is basically a delta to the original invite. And you keep throwing them in as quickly as they come. And it can happen in the middle of a call. So if I change between networks or I plug in a new network card or whatever, um, then you might get enough a candidate. And by baking in trickle ice to the protocol rather than having the re-invite dances, which may or may not be supported and SIP and all that sort of thing, um, is quite fun. And it means that you get the really fast setup that we saw earlier. Um, and then if the callee wants to reject it, they send back an M call hang up. If they want to answer it, it's an M call answer. And then finally, it's an M call hang up from either way to actually hang up. You might notice there are no ringing notifications here yet. We just haven't bothered to define one, but we easily could and add it in there. And whilst doing a SIP gateway, it would be an obvious thing to do. You can do other stuff. So at TechCrunch Disrupt, when we launched, um, actually not when we launched, TechCrunch London, we did a MIDI um, remote jamming system um, over Matrix, where we were going and taking a MIDI synthesizer, taking the um, notes. So you got the, I think that's middle C, the velocity, the note being turned on the channel, and the timestamp in MIDI land when it happened random blobs of data, chucking it into matrix, and then you can have a JavaScript web app that goes and notates it into musical notation. Um, so you have both the real-time MIDI happening over the network and the persistence and the history and the notation in a room. Really cool. Um, we also plugged in a car to it and did lots of Internet of Things stuff. And there may be a dangerous demo later when we plug it into something interesting to see what happens. Server server API, I'm not going to talk you through because we don't have 20 minutes to go through this. It's more complicated because you have both the signature of the message as well as a hash of the message, which allows you to redact the contents because it's really important to be able to redact. Application services are probably the most interesting one from a Camellio perspective because this is where you build bridges to other worlds. So you can do gateways, you can manipulate data, you can filter, translate, index, mine, visualize, orchestrate, whatever you might want. You can do bots, you could do IVR-style services with the AS API. Typical one here in Python is really simple. You just have one API endpoint called transactions, and you get JSON blobs from the server, and you can subscribe to anything you like on the server. It has roots, it has super user privileges to go and puppet the server to do whatever you want. So if, for instance, you had a I uh, know, SIP, um, so you had a free switch and you had a bunch of SIP clients off it and you had the matrix ecosystem over here. AS is really the overlap to go and link the two things together. Wouldn't it be nice if Camellio had um, both a SIP stack and an HTTP stack that you could use to somehow glue the two worlds together? Uh, well, 
I tried to put one of these together yesterday and failed basically because it's been 10 years since I've played with SirConfig. But the general idea is that you take a SIP invite, you turn it into an mcall invite, and you get back an answer. You turn it into the 200 OK um, responding to that transaction, and then you turn the buys into hangups and the hangups into buys, at least for calls going that way through. So I tried to do it using HTTP query from the utils library and the JSON modules. I also played with Ole's um, curl module. And that side of it is fine, going from the SIP transaction to the matrix one, using XHTTP to go and actually um, receive the um, JSON hit back from matrix and turn it into the right response on the right transaction. I was trying to use T reply call ID or dialogue by. If anybody wants to explain to me how I should have done this, then please come and talk to me afterwards, because I'd love to get it working. It was really close. I had Jitsi on one side. and. Um, as the client, and then Camellio um, bridging it through. And I got the call coming into WebRTC, but yeah, no, not the full flow. So finally, where are we at? Uh, we got paid to try to create this new world order in May. Uh, we launched an alpha at TechCrunch in September. Uh, we went into early beta in December. Right now, we're in a good stable beta. It's not super performant, but you can run the servers and the clients, and they don't crash, and it actually all works. In July, we're hoping for possibly a 1.0 release at OSCOM. We'll see how it comes together. And the big stuff to remain is building more gateways, doing the SIP and XMPP bridges. Um, we've already got an IRC bridge, which is really good. We need to polish the spec a lot and bring it up to RFC quality. End-to-end -end encryption is a huge thing. We're using Axolotl. We've gone and built our own implementation for it, but it looks um, really good. We just need to get it out there. And finally, there's a version 2 of the client server API that fixes all of the embarrassing thinkers that we had in version 1. Um, and that's the same information again. Final thing, we do need help on this. Obviously, this is a moonshot. It's wildly overambitious. We're trying to create a whole new ecosystem on the net. We need you to try running a server, tell us where it sucks, join the federation. Our funding is directly linked to the number of people we have using this, both as clients and servers. So please help us out, run a server, install a client, play with it, chat with it, use it as a Slack alternative. Uh, please build gateways, help me debug the Camellio one or implement a better Camellio one. We need to have feedback on the APIs. If you're doing a new app, try Matrix rather than SIP. And finally, follow us on Twitter, retweet everything, and thank you very much. Thank you. Get connected to the matrix. Questions about... Uh... Well, I've got one quick comment. Uh, it's really easy to put, uh, put up a matrix server. We've got two of them. One of them is running on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, it's, it's really that easy. And uh, the results are just super. So give it a go. It's, well, it's easy to do, well worth, to do, well worth doing. Thank you, James. And I think we need Homer to troubleshoot when something doesn't work, or <laughs> everything works, James. OK, a question for um, uh, my side. Um, do you think it will help telecom as you get a more HTTP-like approach, or it's trying to monetize or get the benefits of, of, of the hype with HTTP right now? or? So the, the reason we built it commercially on, and why Amdocs are funding it is because you have this huge split, obviously, between telecom land doing IMS and Volti and RCS and stuff, and then internet land doing over-the-top style applications, as they call internet apps. And the ability for uh, telcos to successfully launch internet style apps is not a perfect track record. We've done a few of them with Amdocs, and Telefonica have done cool stuff with 2Go, et cetera. But there is a clearly a big, big gap there. Matrix is trying to span that gap, something which is both familiar to a SIP audience and can bridge well into SIP and can hook into the core network, but is also very familiar to an internet audience and hopefully allows telcos to build services and anybody really to build services which work in both domains. Okay, thank you. So again, remember they are outside, they have cool demos to see, and if you want to look at their API and see how simple it is, uh, please, Matthew, it's gonna be here. Have you seen a question? No. No? Okay, thank you, Matthew. Thank you Here, for everybody. supporting the event. <laughs>